Welcome back. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful that we can come together as you have called all of creation to sing your praise. For you are indeed worthy of praise. You are indeed worthy of all of our love and our adoration and, uh, as Jesus taught, our obedience. Father, thank you that you are in control. Thank you that we need not fret nor worry nor be anxious about tomorrow. God, you know. You know all the challenges. You know all the struggles. You know all the fears. You know all the obstacles in our way. You know all the needs. You know even the illnesses. You know all the calamities that are happening, whether it's in individual lives or around the world. Father, thank you. Thank you that wherever Jesus is, he's got the authority to speak peace. And he has the authority to command the wind and the waves to be still. And so, Lord, may we not worry. May we not fret. May we be at peace in you, in Christ Jesus. Lord, we come to you because you are our stronghold. You are our refuge. You are the um, tower of deliverance and fortress. Uh, Father, thank you. Thank you that uh, you indeed are our shield, our horn of salvation. Father, we cry out to you for you are worthy of praise. And you are the God who hears and sees and answers. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We come before you that Even when it looks like and we think that you don't know what's going on, you certainly do. And just as the disciples experienced your authority and power over the wind and the waves, as they saw in other occasions, whether it was food being multiplied or the demons being cast out. So God, you have uh, full authority and you've given that authority to Jesus. And so may we take confidence. May we walk with him. May we follow in obedience and in, in humility. So, Father, thank you. Spirit of God, thank you that uh, wherever we are, you urge us to draw near, to go closer. And so we come before you. Lead us by your Spirit, O God, and open up your word to speak to us and into our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to open up God's word in Genesis, and Dulles is going to be reading for us. And so uh, let's uh, read together God's word. Today's reading is from Genesis chapter 32 verse 1 to 12 Uh, Genesis chapter 32 verse 1 to 12 Jacob also went on his way and the angels of God met him when Jacob saw them he said this is the camp of God so he named that place Mahanam Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Ezel in the land of Seir the country of Edom he instructed them, This is what you are to say to my master Ezel. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban, and I have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, men servants and maid servants. Now I am sending this message to my Lord, that I may find favor in your eyes. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Ezel, and now he is coming to meet you, and four hundred men are with him. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him in two groups, and the flocks and the herds and the camels as well. He thought if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Go back to your country and your and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and the faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two groups. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Ezel, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosperous and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. This is the word of the Lord. All right. Thank you, Dallas. Uh, Now let's uh, read together God's word in the response of Psalm 18, verses 1 to 27. Uh, Once again, the words are up on the screen, and I invite you to respond with the underlined font. Let's uh, read God's word together. 
I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise. The cords of death entangled me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. In my distress, I call to the Lord. From his temple, he heard my voice. The earth trembled and quaked, and the foundations of the mountains shook. Smoke rose from his nostrils. He parted the heavens and came down. He mounted the cherubim and flew. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, the dark rain clouds of the sky. The Lord thundered from heaven. He shot his arrows and scattered the enemy. The valleys of the sea were exposed and the foundations of the earth laid bare. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He rescued me from my powerful enemy. They confronted me in the day of my disaster. He brought me out into a spacious place. The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. All his laws are before me. I have been blameless before him and have kept myself from sin. To the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To the pure, you show yourself pure, but to the devious, you show yourself shrewd. Amen. We continue as we want to uh, remind you, uh, for our church family, offerings are made uh, are possible to be made online via uh, email transfer or interact, and so uh, the instructions are on the invitation email, uh, the weekly newsletter email that was sent out this morning. Uh, as well, for any guests who are, uh, who are wishing to make a donation or contribution to this ministry, it is possible via your credit card at canadahelps.org, canadahelps.org, and you just need to enter our church name, Lakeside Heights Baptist Church, and that will, be, uh, that will come up. All right, let's uh, take a moment to pray together as we bring not only our offerings but our lives before the Lord. So let's pray together. Loving God, we're grateful that we can come to you, that nobody may know our troubles, that though people may not see our sorrows, our fears, or our pain, or our scars, we, we can come before you, for you know, Lord. We come before you, perhaps with heavy burdens. We come before you with offerings of thanksgiving and praise. We come before you with needs of our daily bread for ourselves, for our family members, for our loved ones. We come before you for the, with the needs of those around us who don't yet know you, who haven't received salvation, who haven't invited you into their lives. And so, God, we come before you 
Thank you. Thank you that you are a God of mercy, of power, of justice. Thank you that we can come before you uh, not needing to hide everything or anything, not needing to uh, light a candle or bow down to an idol. And God, you, you say in your word that, that, uh, that you are not a God who can be created out of wood or metal, but that you are the creator. So there's nothing that we can make nor should make with our hands and bow down. And so, God, we come in our hearts in humility to the cross where Jesus bled for us, giving you praise and thanksgiving. We offer our offerings and our uh, investments into your kingdom, whether it's donations to the uh, World Vision uh, in terms of uh, the Beirut relief, whether it's in, ter in terms of uh, missions for the four organizations that we support, whether it's in terms of this church ministry, or any other Christ-honoring ministry, both near and far. God, we come before you and we give it to you with thanksgiving, with joy. Lord, we also want to lay our lives before you and thanking, thanking you for all the provisions that you have made uh, in our lives. Thank you for our daily bread. Thank you for our family, for our friends. Thank you for the health that we enjoy. Thank you for the great weather we've been enjoying as well. But Lord, we also want to lift up the needs. There are those who are uh, sick and who are ill and who are needing your strength. Thank you for others yet who are recovering, who are gaining strength, who have been touched by your hand, who have been strengthened. Some who have come through the valley of the shadow of death. And for them, we give you praise. For others also that you have heard their cries of provision and of help, and you have heard and delivered them, and we give you praise. Lord, we are continuing to face the pandemic. We are continuing to um, see cases both diminish here, but also increase elsewhere. And so, God, we ask for your mercy. Blessed is the nation whose God is you, God, whose God is Yahweh, whose God is Jesus. And so, Lord, have mercy upon many places, many countries, and the peoples that are facing dire circumstances. God, we're also grateful that you are the one who is in control of uh, our current situation, uh, both politically, economically, health-wise, that there is nothing too big for you nor too small, and that it is all uh, in the palm of your hands. And so, Lord, we want to entrust ourselves God, for some of us, we are, in fact, living through a time of a turmoil of wind and waves. And so, God, speak peace in our lives, we pray. For others, yet, we're in a time of transition as Jacob is going from uh, Laban's home back to his homeland, but to face uh, uh, his brother's wrath. And so, God, for the people in transition, we ask for your hand over them, that they would trust you, cry out to you. They would seek for your deliverance and your provision and your salvation. God, we also want to lift up for the, the souls of uh, many, uh, even in our own family members who don't know you, who don't trust you. God, we pray for a hunger to arise, just that uh, it would be unhealthy if we didn't eat and didn't experience and feel that hunger. So God, may we, you uh, just magnify and amplify that need for you, that, that hole that only you can fill, that yearning that, that calls onto their souls that is only uh, meant and uh, able to be filled by you. God, we pray for that kingdom to come in our lives, in our hearts, as well as those around us. And so help us to have a kingdom vision, to be hungry and desperate for you, to be at work in our lives, to use us to bring forth the gospel. Father, thank you that uh, we can come together uh, through uh, online and, uh, and worship you together, but we also look forward to gathering in person once again. And so grant us wisdom, uh, grant us grace, continue to uh, imbue our leaders with wisdom and uh, selflessness so that it isn't out of their own personal interests but rather the good of the people and the well-being of the population that they have at heart. And Father, as we come to your word, Lord, help us to take it seriously. Help us to look honestly into the mirror of your word. 
so that we would see your goodness and your holiness as well as to see ourselves. And where we fall short, Jesus, you make up for us on the cross. Where we have sinned, you give us your righteousness. And so, God, thank you. Lord, may we be uh, empowered by your Holy Spirit to live for you, to serve you, and to serve and love one another. So, God, as we come to your word, open our hearts and our minds and our lives uh, that your spirit may guide us. In the name of Jesus, your son, we pray. Amen. We're going to listen to God's word and read together in Mark chapter 4 as Isaac leads us uh, in uh, 4, 35 to 41. Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. Jesus calms the storm. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A fierce squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that I was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet! Be still! Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. All right, thank you to Dulles and Isaac for leading us in the scriptures. And as we now come, uh, we continue our study in the journey of Jacob. And uh, last Sunday we looked at how God had brought salvation and resolution to that conflict with Laban. He was able to obey the Lord, depart from Laban's household, and yet to go in peace. And they had made a treaty there that neither would go across uh, that uh, pillar that they had established to go and harm the other person. They, they promised before God and before the relatives that neither would harm the other. And so God continues to guide Jacob. And as we uh, read in J chapter 32, as Dulles read for us, we see that as Jacob begins to go back and resumes his way, the angels of God come and meet, meet him. Now, whenever we read angels, so some of us might have visions of, uh, uh, I don't know, these little flying creatures with wings on their backs. And I, I don't know what angels look like. I don't think they look like uh, Michael Landon, for those who remember the series. But regardless, Jacob, if you remember some 20 years before, he had seen the angels in that vision as God revealed to him in the middle of the night. And as God spoke and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham, and your father, Isaac. And just as I was with them, I will also be with you. And that promise to be with Jacob, some 20 years later, God confirms once again as he reveals his presence by the angels that come. And though uh, it may not have been so evident for the other people, when Jacob sees them, he recognizes them right away. These are the holy angels, servants from God. And so he says, this is the camp of God. So he named that place Mahanaim. You see, it was, he, he had a large household, so he, he had his whole troop, his whole uh, camp moving. And yet, when he sees the angels, he realizes that this was not only his camp, but that this was also the camp of God. How often is it that in life we think we're by ourselves, we're all alone, we're perhaps even abandoned by God, only to realize when God reveals and opens our eyes that, no, God did not abandon us. Much like the Proverbs, uh, footprints in the sand, so it is that, though we don't always realize it, in later years, in hindsight, in thinking of what could have been, we realize God was with us. Even now, uh, as, as the people of Lebanon and Beirut go through this uh, travesty, this, this devastation, the thought occurred, 
You know, it's, it's happened here. It's happened in, in August. Imagine if it happened in, in the winter, and I understand their winters are not like ours here in Canada, in Montreal. But by all means, uh, their winters can be so cold, and it would have been so much more difficult for them to face that. And we know from all the facts that's come out that this was a series of mistakes where the dangerous ammonium nitrate was stored together for six years, despite the warnings of officials that said we need to store this in a safer way. And yet, there are stories where God is protecting, God is rescuing, God is hearing and I've also been reading the accounts of where, how God is using uh, Christians to bring relief and help. And in that light, uh, World Vision is uh, on the ground uh, seeking to provide uh, disaster relief. And the government of Canada is uh, matching donations. So uh, we're inviting the congregation to donate directly to World Vision. And uh, the link is included in the email of uh, that campaign. And uh, up until August 24th, so you can do this uh, either this Sunday or th the next week, uh, whatever donation, uh, World Vision uh, and other nonprofit organization and uh, 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 what is disaster relief agencies receive in donation, the government of Canada will match it up to a certain cap. And so we're inviting our congregation uh, to give, to consider. And as I mentioned during our Bible study, uh, Lebanon is, in fact, a place that Jesus had walked. If you remember, Jesus have, having walked in Tyre and Sidon, Jesus was there. And so this is another opportunity for us uh, to encourage the people of Lebanon to bring uh, assistance and relief through our Christian friends, uh, through the ministry of World Vision. And so uh, we invite the congregation this Sunday and next uh, to, to, for those who feel led by God um, to make that uh, financial contribution uh, to bring disaster relief. So as Jacob sees the angels and realizes and proclaims, I'm not alone. It isn't just us in our one camp. It isn't only on the human realm, but God is faithful. Do you remember just at the end of the previous chapter that Jacob had built an altar and made a sacrifice unto God? And I'm of the firm belief that when we uh, bring an offering that pleases God, when we make a sacrifice, and it doesn't have to be a burnt offering, it doesn't have to be a financial offering, it doesn't have to be even a, something visible. It can even be a sacrifice of serving someone of making a phone call to, to see, to fellowship, and to ask how they're doing, to let them know that we haven't forgotten them. Whatever moment and token and step of obedience and sacrifice we make, whenever we make something, we, we walk in obedience to honor the Lord, and He is pleased, the Lord answers. The Lord answered uh, Solomon when he brought a sacrifice that was worthy that was heartfelt, that was sincere. And as Jacob made that sacrifice uh, when he made that treaty with Laban, so God was pleased. So God was pleased by Jacob's obedience. And here he reminds Jacob that God is with him. I've been reading some account of uh, uh, the famous missionary Hudson Taylor in China. And both Prior to going and uh, once he arrived in China, he lived with uh, a significant uh, lack. Certainly lack of finances, lack of warmth, often lack of housing. And yet, the more the surroundings lacked, the more he trusted in God. And the more he trusted in God, the more he felt God's reassurance and reminder and encouragement that God was with him. So much so that in his most discouraging times, as he pleaded with the Lord, as he trusted the Lord, as he, as he clung to the Lord, he says that 
uh, scarce a time when he opened the Bible and he wasn't filled with joy and gratitude and tears welled up that God knew him and was speaking to him through his word. So often we, uh, especially today, but we like to think that if we are physically well, right, if we are materially uh, provided for, that that's a confirmation that God is blessing us. And often it is, no doubt. But you and I both know from our own life experience that we are all the more grateful for food when we have been truly hungry. We are all the more grateful and worshipful when God saves us and rescues us from a dire situation. And so here, in this desert place, God comes and makes his presence known uh, through the angels. And we have no idea what interchange they had, what dialogue. But as Jacob uh, then proceeds to come up with this plan, because he first sends the messengers uh, to his brother, letting him know that Your brother Jacob and his household are on their way. And he wants to assuage Esau and soften Esau's heart. And in the message you see that your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and I have remained there until now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, men servants and maid servants. And now I'm sending this message to my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. In, even in the message, he bows before Esau and says, Your servant Jacob is coming. And I want to tell my Lord uh, that I am on my way so that I may find favor in your eyes. And as the days pass, and finally the messengers return, Jacob, each night, each day, Wondering, what will my brother say? What will my brother think? Will he welcome me back? Will he forgive me for what I've done? Or will he come in rage and revenge? Remember, Jacob is now coming to face the situation. He's now coming to harvest that which he has sown. It's been 20 years. It's been a long time. But Jacob is coming home to face the music. You see, uh, we say that revenge is not the answer. And we know that it isn't the answer because it only perpetuates uh, the wrongs. But there needs also to be restitution. There also needs to be resolution. And Jacob deceived his brother, deceived his father. And now, after 20 years, where that bitterness, that rage has festered. And the last time we saw his brother Esau, this is what Esau did. And this is uh, chapter 30, 27, verse 41. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Esau had plotted revenge at the time and after 20 years. Now it's possible. It's possible that uh, Esau has grown to forgive uh, Jacob. It's possible that Esau has been blessed and uh, has been perhaps uh, um, given wisdom and uh, just matured to realize that life is too short to live with that bitterness, hanging on to that. Or it could be that that rage has festered and grown over all this time. And so when the messengers finally come back 
And as Jacob is told, the messengers are on their way. He starts worrying. He starts being anxious. What, what, what did my brother say? And as the messengers finally come and they deliver the news, we have sent, given the message to your brother. He is now on his way with 400 of his men. If you and I were, were Jacob, how would we feel? How would we react? As big as Jacob's camp was, as wealthy as he had become, he would have been, they would have been no match for army of Esau and his 400 men. I have to believe that Jacob turned white as snow, hearing that his brother and 400 of his men are coming out to meet them. And the verse 7 says as much, in fear, in great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups. Insofar as he can, he devises his plan. If Jacob is going to come and slaughter us, Perhaps we can divide ourselves into two camps so that if he begins to attack, then perhaps the second camp, who is going to be at a distance, might have a chance to flee and escape his rage. Because he thought if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. Jacob does the best of his ability to come up with a solution. But he faces the situation knowing that his chances are not good. Not only is his life in peril, his whole household, his wives, his children, all of the men servants and maid servants, all of the flocks, his entire life, all the 20 years, all the blessings that he's received, all of it would be annihilated if Esau came in his full rage. And so Jacob, Jacob does what every human being by instinct does, cry out for salvation. But Jacob cries out not to an unknown God. He cries out in saying this, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, O Yahweh, who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. Jacob knows exactly who he's crying out to. Who do you cry out to when there is danger, when there is illness, when there is financial distress, when there is hopelessness and darkness? Who do you cry out to? Jacob cried out and named him. Just as God had uh, uh, identified himself and revealed himself and said, I am the God of your father Abraham, God of your father Isaac. So Jacob cries out to him as God revealed himself. People like to uh, dismiss the notion that there is only one way to God because they find it ob objectionable. But the only way to God is the way God reveals it. Who are you and I to say there can't be just one way? There must be another way. There must be many ways. No one. No one can come to the Father except the way that he made available. And the fact is, you and I don't deserve any way. Why? We read together in the response of Psalm, where uh, the, the psalmist cries out and says that, right? He says, I have kept the ways of the Lord. The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness. I have been blameless before him uh, and have kept myself from sin. Who of us can proclaim that in truth? And the reality is none of us can. No matter what human mistakes we recognize, whatever regrets we may have, the fact is, whether we like to admit it or not, we 
have sinned before God. None of us have been blameless or sinless before him. And if God had truly reward, rewarded us according to our righteousness, it would be as Paul wrote in Romans, for the wages of sin is death. As God revealed in uh, the Torah that the bull in shedding of blood had to pay for sin. But you see, I am of the firm belief that those verses that we've read together in Psalm 18 was the declaration of Jesus. For Jesus kept the ways of the Lord. For Jesus, all the laws are before him, and in, in him, he is a fulfillment of all the laws. And the Lord has rewarded us according to Jesus' righteousness and according to, to the cleanliness of his hands. We have received the gift and the blessing that Jesus earned. And he, in return, took on the punishment that was due to us. And that was God's way of showing his faithfulness. He accomplished the requirement. He fulfilled and met the requirement when we failed to do so. And so Jacob prays, O God of my father, Abraham and my father Isaac, you, Yahweh, who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. And that's our confession. In Christ Jesus, God, we're not worthy, but you bestow that honor, that blessing to us, that forgiveness. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan but now I have become two groups. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. Save me, O God, for my brother will attack me and my wives and my children. It's easy for us when we're not under threat to think that we would uh, be heroic and that we would uh, protect others instead of protecting ourselves. But the reality is when our life is in danger, and I only uh, heard this recently that 60% uh, of our brain shuts down and we go into this uh, survival mode. And yet when the danger came, Jesus said, not my will be done, but yours, Father. And it took that drink that we were destined to drink. And so he cries out. He cries out in desperation, God, save us. God, save us. We see that same cry from the disciples in the boat when their life is in danger. When the wind and the waves come. And anyone who's been out in the water in, in windy or in choppy conditions can know We are no match against the wind and the waves of life. When the diagnosis of cancer comes, when the financial strains of creditors and debt come and overwhelm us, when the strains of relationships that have broken down and there is not only conflict, but perhaps there is chasm. When there are disasters, whether it's man-made or natural disasters that come, we cry out, God, save us. Hosanna, God, save us. We sing Hosanna uh, at every Palm Sunday, uh, or we at least read the scripture. And it was at that time a declaration of praise. But it was originally a dec declaration of desperate plea for help. Hosanna, oh God, save us. This is a cry of Jacob. This is a cry of the disciples. This is a cry of every human being who faces, whether it's human physical death or other life challenges or even their own souls. Oh God, save us. Oh God, save us. Jacob says, God, you promised. Be true unto yourself. 
and save us, we pray. For the disciples, it's hard to blame them again. On one hand, we would like to think, well, the disciples should have known better. They saw Jesus doing the miracles. They saw what he could do. They should have believed in him. And yet, when we look at our own lives, how much do we trust the Lord? The word of God tells us to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do we trust God with everything? Would we be willing to trust him with all of our finances, time, health, strength? Would we be willing to sacrifice it all for him? When the danger comes, the real testing occurs. Once again, Hudson Taylor says, in reflecting upon all the times of hardship, he said he needed that training for God to condition him and prepare him for all of the other troubles that were coming down the road. And because of all the difficulties that he had faced, he would be a greater leader as he paved the way for other missionaries after him. At one point, he was getting desperate because he was told he would have to uh, vacate the house that he was in. It belonged to a, a different mission organization, and one of their missionaries was going to come. And at the time, in, in Shanghai, there was war, civil war going on, and there was nowhere. It wasn't even a question of money, although he didn't have money. There was no uh, house to be found for rent. And when he inquired with his mission organization if they would send money for him to buy land and build, they said no, that their plan and desire was for the his, for the group and the missionaries to go inland rather than stay in Shanghai. And despite the fact that that was bitter news because the, the home base just didn't understand the circumstances that he was facing, he went about to think of how he could make the best of this situation. And with no prospect of home, and again, that's something that's very, very difficult for us to imagine unless we've actually been there. The looming eviction, no place to go, no availability. He thought, well, the people that I am uh, living with now, they're moving into a new city to min minister there. Why don't I go with them? And as he thought about it, he came up with this plan. You know what? I can afford to buy myself a boat and live out on the water as many of the people do there. Imagine how desperate the situation would have been that he determined that he would buy a boat and live on the water. And so the day came when he had to go and uh, hire the boat that would take uh, transport his uh, friend missionary family into the, into the new uh, destination. But on his way, he, he met a, a Chinese man who was saying, are you looking for a house? Are you looking for a place to live? It turns out he, this Chinese man, had uh, uh, built a home, but he ran out of funds, so it wasn't fully finished. And so um, he was telling him about the house, and finally uh, Hudson Taylor agreed to see this house. And sure enough, just as the man had described, it was a small but uh, mostly complete home, just the size and great location that he had hoped for. And just when he had entrusted and said, look, I have no other way. I'm willing to do this most desperate measure of living on the water. And moreover, he had made the commitment to say to himself, I'm going to give up my British wardrobe. I'm going to give up my European wardrobe. And I'm going to not only clothe myself as the natives here in China, but that he was going to adopt their hairstyle as well. And f folks, I mean, if you've seen some of the older era kung fu movies, you might uh, see the scenes. But essentially, the men would, have, would shave the front portion of their head and have a longer hair tied together or wo uh, woven together in the back. And as, I guess, normal that as that would have looked in the day for the people, that would have been an unthinkable a sight for this Westerner. And for him, it was no easy decision to give up his 
culture, his a hairstyle that uh, he had had all his life, to make himself look perhaps ridiculous in some people's eyes. What is this white man doing putting on Chinese wardrobe and uh, taking on a Chinese haircut? What does this white man think he is? But as he said, I'm willing to do whatever it takes for the gospel. And it wasn't instantaneous. It was, a, it was actually a, um, a debate that raged within him. And when he finally made that decision, and God opened up and provided for the home when all hope seemed to die. And when he went ahead, surrendered his clothes, surrendered his culture, surrendered his, even his own hairstyle, God opened up homes and doors and opportunity for ministry that he had hitherto been un, uh, uh, unwelcome to. The doors of opportunity so opened, welcome, being welcomed into the homes of uh, the people he met. When we give up all of, that, all of the plans and all the things that we trust in and say, God, I can't trust in anything else, but I trust in you. When we obey the words of Proverbs 3 that says, uh, trust, do not trust, do not lean upon your own understanding, but instead trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And I'm sure it's, it's hard. It's hard for us. We like to think we're logical, we're intelligent, we're, we're planning. We like to think that we take a lot of the information into account. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not upon your own understanding. The fishermen knew the wind and the waves. They knew how bad it could be. They've known people who have died and perished out at sea. You go into any fishing village, they know. They have a healthy respect and fear for the water. The disciples, some of them career fishermen, they were afraid for their lives. And so when they awake Jesus and say, do you not care? Do you not care, Jesus, that we're about to die? Jesus gets up and rebukes the wind and waves and says, be quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Just as uh, when we turn on uh, the switch in the room at night and the house becomes bright, so it is. It was the opposite. Jesus said, quiet. And the wind and the waves died instantly. And the disciples went from being terrified of the, uh, of, for their lives to being terrified as to what just happened. And so Jesus asks them, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Don't you see that I'm with you? Yes, I was sleeping, but I'm with you. Perhaps for some of you, you feel that God is quiet. Perhaps you think because he's quiet, he's distant. But God says clearly, I am not a God who slumbers nor a God who sleeps, right? Am I the God who created the eye, not able to see? Am I the God who created the arm, not able to reach out and save you? Even if we think Jesus is sleeping, even if we think God is silent, God invites us, invites us to trust him and to cry out to him. Cry out to him, Hosanna, Lord, save us. This is our situation, God. We have no one else to turn to, but save us, O oh God. And we're going to continue seeing how God hears and answers the prayer of Jacob. But folks, whatever your situation is, this is God's invitation. It isn't just the story that's supposed to be out in the Genesis account and just the story for the disciples. It's supposed to be the le lesson that we learn and get inspired by. It's supposed to be the relationship that we experience ourselves as we relate and cry out to God our Father. This is his invitation. I rescued Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I rescued the disciples. On the cross, I rescued you. 
in the name of Jesus, when we come to God and ask him, he will hear. When we ask in Jesus' name, Jesus says, I will answer. So may we come to God. May we trust in God. May we cry out to God, God, save us. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. God, you are worthy. You are powerful. You are mighty. I don't see hope. I don't see opportunity. I don't see a solution. But you are able, O God. Just as we sang earlier, he will come and save you. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Why? Because he's powerful. Because he's my deliverer. Because he's my stronghold and refuge. And so we're going to sing together. But before we do, let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you that you are able. Thank you that you are above this situation. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so it is that you are above our condition. You see, you know, and God, you are able. And just as Jacob cried out, we also pray, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we come to you, O God, Yahweh, God of Jacob, God of Israel, God of Jesus, who sent your only son. We come before you. We cry out to you. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus, you are the one who comes in the name of Yahweh. Jesus, Yeshua, you are the one who comes and delivers us. Thank you. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for provision. Thank you for your rescue and your uh, hand in our lives. Your blood that washes our sins away. The cross which opens the gate and reestablishes the path and the relationship to the Father above. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Holy Spirit. May we trust in you today. May we cry out to you today in the holy, precious, and powerful name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. So let's sing together Hosanna in the highest and come together as we close for benediction.